Well, thank you very much, and I am so uh, pleased to be here tonight. I'd like to congratulate the honorees and the school for the wonderful work it's been doing. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, so I want to walk through a fair bit of material. Uh, I think you'll find it an interesting panorama of what I see as one of the critical issues of our day. Um, you may find uh, a little bit of it, you know, perhaps disturbing, which is why I've asked my driver to leave the car running. <laughs> but what I want to talk about, and in fact, one of your distinguished uh, uh, policy uh, as, uh, uh, fellows, uh, Mr. Harper, Stephen Harper, has just written a book on the topic I want to talk about, so there'll be a bit of an intersection. But I want to talk about the new populism, which is maybe, in some respects is a, a reiteration of some versions of populism we've seen in the past. But I think it's really important to understand this, and I want to look at in the, in the, through the prism of culture, economics, and democracy. It seems that everybody's talking about populism now, and for good reason. It's, I think it's probably one of the most powerful forces reshaping Western democracy. I think it's critical for us to understand a, a, a clearer understanding of the causes and consequences. As policymakers, we really want to know what the true causes are because if we want to intervene and deal with things, it's not good to just deal with the symptoms. I see a lot of controversy about what's really causing what and what are the consequences. It would be notable that nobody was talking about populism at the beginning of this century. In fact, most people were talking about globalization. If you look at the Google searches on globalization, they've plummeted. Nobody cares about globaliz globalization. Everybody cares about populism. That inverse pattern is not a coincidence. Those two things are pretty intimately connected. Uh, I'd like to note as well that populism, the term is used kind of loosely, but it's, it's, it's an ideologically thin phenomenon. There are populist expressions on the left, on the right, even on the center. But I think what unifies all of them is an idea of what one person called the pure people versus the cor corrupt elite. And that is at the heart of all populist movements. Despite the variety of populist expressions, the ones that we're seeing in upper North America, particularly the most potent ones, are actually of a particular type, which we're calling ordered populism. And I'm gonna try and explain how that emerged and what it means and how we might deal with it. Because I think a lot of the responses have been things like, oh, that's really surprising, I didn't see that coming which isn't a very good response, or, you know, isn't that deplorable that people think that way, which ignores the real reasons that it's happened and just adds emotional fuel to the fire of those who are being drawn into that uh, worldview. So let me start this uh, presentation by beginning with a review of what I think is the, or the original impetus which put this stuff in motion. Um, we, uh, at, the be at the end of this century, we were, we were talking about globalization, but we we're also celebrating the end of history. We now lived in a flat world where we would be floated on an infinite cloud of prosperity on the basis of information technology and globalization. That prediction uh, really fell apart in this century uh, as the ba basic sense of uh, shared progress, which had been a feature of the last half of the 20th century, really disappeared for a lot of people. And uh, I think this phenomena where the end of history was replaced by, in many people's minds, an end of progress, an end of the middle class dream, is really the thing which put all of this in motion. And for those who might sort of wonder if this is really just you know, something that we talk about, I wanna show you how these things have unfolded through time. This first chart, and I don't have a lot to show you, but this first chart uh, tracks a question which we've looked at right back to the beginning of this century. Do you think you're gonna be better off five years from now? Pretty straightforward question. If you look at the beginning of the chart, you see by a margin of 50% to 15%, everybody thought, you know, five years from now, I'm gonna be doing better. If I took that chart back 25 years in time, it would look the very same. But look how different it looks today. The numbers actually have dropped to the point where the number of people who think they're gonna be doing worse off is actually larger than the number that think they aren't. What's also interesting here is look at the rather in impressive rise, it's still not back to those high levels of 55%, but the numbers have risen quite significantly over the last few years. And this may suggest that while all this is going on, there may be a bit of a relaxation of this deep sense of anxiety that a better future, the middle class dream, is no longer available. And that middle class dream is really as simple as if I work hard, if I invent a better mousetrap, I'm going to do better than my parents, uh, I'm going to have a house, I'm going to retire in relative security, my kids will do better than me. That's all in shambles. I'll show you why 
For example, if you look at this particular slide, which tracks the incidence of people who locate themselves as members of the middle class, self-defined membership, which is a pretty good predictor of things like income, but an even better, almost uncanny predictor of things like health and whether you're, you're happy with your life. In both Canada and the United States, the incidence of people who located themselves in the middle class dropped at the beginning of the century from around 65% down to under 50%. So think about it. In the United States, 60 million people fell out of the middle class. A lot of the points of entry into the middle class in the 20th century, a strong back and a union card, were no longer available. And this has produced, ultimately mutated into some of the future, uh, things we're seeing today. But I also want to point out, because I want to have a little bit of optimism in this presentation, that there has been a very significant movement up. It's not nearly back to the levels we wanted, but the incidence of people who are locating the middle class is once again on the rise, which may expect explain why we're seeing some of the closing attitudes on things like immigration and in trade moving back up in a more positive direction in Canada. I do want to point out that when people are asked, do you think the next generation is going to be better off than you, which remember was the whole idea of the middle class dream, only about 10 to 13 percent of Canadians and Americans believe that. That number two is going up a bit, but that's a paralytic self-fulfilling prophecy that stays in place. So how does the strength of the consensus, and by the way, the policy experts out there like Damon Asmoglu and others who talk about why nations fail, basically say it's a shift from inclusive economies to extractive economies. But if you look at this sort of broad concept of the middle class and say, having a growing optimistic middle class is a precondition for having a successful society and a growing economy. Only 6% of Canadians disagree. But when we look at the two conditions which are necessary to secure that, a growing and optimistic middle class, you can see that the, only a tiny minority think that's in place. That's a big problem. I'm going to add one more factor into this gloomy picture, which is the idea uh, that the world has become not so much the oyster it was as we closed out the last century and it was all going to be wonderful. It's become more of a Pandora's box of all kinds of frightening things. So if I was to ask the experts, Ten years ago, was the world safer than it is today? Uh, or is there, has the world become safer than it was ten years ago? Most would say yes. There's some problems in some areas, but generally speaking, deaths are down, lives are higher. But when I ask Canadians that, the number that agree with the right answer is 3%. Now, some have argued, and I will support this, that a combination of economic despair, a sense of a future which is no longer moving forward, and a magnified sense of external risk engage what's been called in the past an authoritarian, but what I prefer to call an ordered personality. And I think that's actually been going on in spades. Um, now, I'll just... Now, what I think this has produced is a shift of the traditional axis of left-right dispute about what the future should look like to a, a contest based on what we call ordered and open. And I'm going to try and explain that a little bit and how this is really so different from the left-right, the more familiar left-right debates that we had in the past. So, for example, let's give a stylized depiction of what the left side of the spectrum looked like. It was collectivist. It believed in strong role of the state, active government. It believed that social ills were societally produced or environmentally determined. It would prefer rehabilitation rather than punishment when it came to crime. Now, look at the other side of the ledger. We have individualism was the hallmark of the, left, of the right side of the spectrum, self-reliance, hard work, individualism, minimal government, Individuals author social programs, social problems, and punishment is the right antidote for dealing with this bad behavior. Well, think about it. Individualism has nothing to do with this new version of ordered populism, which is stressing things like nationalism, nativism, white chauvinism, all kinds of things which have very little to do with, collective, with individualism. Minimal government? No. The kinds of things that are, ex, uh, that are uh, ex becoming attractive to people who find this ordered personality engaged under these circumstances, they look for a man on a horse that's going to do decisive things to make things better, to take back control, to make America great. The, the slogans uh, are ones which remind people that it's possible, those people who feel they've lost their place in the economy, that it's possible to return. The basic, uh, in, in Mr. Harper's book, he, he, he borrows some work from uh, David uh, Goodhart on the idea of anywheres and elsewheres. And it is a useful concept for understandings 
The anywheres are the people, the new global elite that are in departure lounges of airports. The somewheres are the ones that lived in the burned out factory districts or just basic solid communities who feel they've been left behind in this, in this bargain. What's interesting though, that I've seen some work done in the Brexit aftermath that modeled the degree to which knowing where someone lived in a burned out factory district or downtown London predicted how they voted and it accounted for about 5% of the variance. But when someone put into that model a question that said, I think sex criminals should be whipped in prison, it accounted for seven times the explanation of geography. Well, guess what that's measuring? It's measuring an ordered or authoritarian outlook. And that is something that I think is at the heart of some of these things we're seeing here. It's also produced a very inflamed attitude to things like immigration, much more tepid responses to uh, trade liberalization and globalization in particular. Uh, anyway, this, uh, there, uh, I just want to make the point that this is a very different phenomenon. It's changed very rapidly in Canada when we look at the way the political landscape has altered in just the last few years. It's, it's really remarkable at the pace which these things are going. And we do talk about the fact that there has been a rise in northern populism and it shares a lot of the same features of the populism that propelled Donald Trump and Brexit to victory, but it does have some unique Canadian features. It shares, for example, things like deep pessimism about the future. Uh, it's rooted a lot in, like, in the working class. For example, Doug Ford's victory in Ontario, he won overwhelmingly with working class. That's not the traditional bailiwick for conservative governments of the past. The, uh, the, uh, the, these people ha are deeply pessimistic. Again, that's not a typical feature of a conservative constituency. But when we put the idea that, in broad brushstrokes, you think the idea that things like immigration, globalization might not be that good for you and that populism might be a good thing, we see that, you know, the public themselves are pretty split on this. Only, only about 33% say, well, I'm sure it's a bad thing. We're going to take a wait and see attitude. And when I go on and say, do you think it's happening in Canada? 80% say, you bet. And uh, I think they're right. And it's something that's been moving very, very quickly. We try and measure this with some multiple indicators that are drawn from some of the traditional work. I don't have time to get into the work of Theodore Adorno and Hannah Arendt and others who tried to come up with this theory, which has been adopted and refined. So for example, today, instead of asking people the questions directly, we ask questions like, so when you're raising a child, do you think it's more important to emphasize uh, creativity or good behavior? You know, Canadians are pretty split on that, you know? And by the way, I want to point out that when we put these together and portray the people that are drawn to the ordered personality, um, in normal circumstances, healthy societies, healthy economies require a good equilibrium of both an ordered outlook and an open outlook, which is the pejorative version is a chaotic outlook. And uh, it's just that when the things become disrupted under the conditions that I mentioned, economic despair and a magnified sense of external risk, it tends to produce things which are often unhealthy. In fact, if we were to array the examples of populist movements, particularly of these types, on a historical spectrum, they would range from disappointing to disastrous. So I think we can agree that even though we can be sympathetic to the, 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 the kind of injuries of class and so forth, which have put these things in motion, that they rarely produce any solutions. In fact, there is a view that the people subscribing to these sorts of things don't really think they're necessarily gonna make America great or help them take back control but they'd like to burn the house down because they're so angry about how their future has been squandered by the, the global elites and professionals and intellectuals and so forth. Uh, just to give it a little local feel, we, we distribute this with a very large sample of 17,000 cases and we can show how the distribution of this ordered outlook works in Canada. I just thought I'd throw the city ones because we could get Calgary and Edmonton come in here and although they are pretty well in average in terms of being open, which is, and the plurality are open, they do have a higher concentration of sorted outlook, which is, is more prevalent in, um, in Alberta. Uh, by the way, when I do this on a neighborhood basis, a community basis, it's the, the results are even more striking. And if I map this distribution, for example, around Toronto and link it up to the last Ontario elections, uh, Ford Nation looks very much as people who are on the ordered side of the spectrum, which I mentioned there's some difference between Canadian northern populism of this variety and the American. First of all, it's a little smaller in terms of numbers here. Uh, not that much, but a little smaller. It, it is not circumscribed by race as it is in the United States. The northern populism in Canada includes uh, people on, uh, who are new Canadians as well as traditional Canadians. What is interesting is that it's higher in communities which have high degrees of ethnic homogeneity. 
whether that's an all white or an all brown neighborhood, those are the places that tend to put a grave emphasis our proclivity to the ordered outlook. I want to talk a bit about values, okay, and why would we talk about values? Well, values, unlike all of the other ephemera of public opinion that I measure and attitudes which move around mercurially, move in a rather glacial fashion, which is kind of a good thing because they're a statement, they're signposts that tell us what kind of society do you live, want to live in? How would you like to be seen by the external world? What kind of country or society would you like to hand off to your children? And as such, they become very important. And they're also very emotionally resonant, which is why value arguments are much more efficacious in the political realm than discussions of policy plumbing, a point that's been left on, lost on many progressive policy analysts. If we were to compare, and I, I have a longer list, but I thought I just this one would suffice, and this shows the shifts over the last 25 years in values, and largely they've been the same, but there are some really notable exceptions. At the bottom of the list, you'll see respect for authority, uh, minimal government intrusions, and traditional family values. Now, I'd really like to draw your attention more to the two, respect for authority and traditional family values. These have kind of plummeted from being really important values to being, frankly, almost irrelevant for many Canadians. So it's ironic and perplexing why these values, which are at the heart of a lot of this ordered populist desire to turn back the clock, to recreate a society where I felt a sense of privilege and security and comfort. And in some respects, it looks like it's almost the, the, uh, the a kind of a last stand of portions with, of society which demographically and in values normatively are losing their position in society, and this is the response. The tension between the shifts in values and the directions of political results is something which is producing tension. We'll see how that gets resolved, but as time goes on, that is something to watch. I thought I'd look at the issue of identity as well, and we've heard a lot of talk about how people form identities. Is it an attachment to your country, to your province, to you know, your ethnic group? But one issue that I thought would be really important given uh, an ongoing debate about whether too much culture and too much diversity actually can have a corrosive impact on our ability to have a cohesive society, and that national identity would be diminished, and that we would then, if there was too much diversity, have a proliferation of ethnic enclaves and ghettos and so forth. Well, I thought it was interesting, once again, to look at the actual data through time, because even though Neil Basundath made a very good case, which on the prima facie, I thought, was impressive, and which has been rebooted by Maxime Bernier, I thought it would be interesting to look at what happened in terms of the actual hard data. These questions track in a similar long period of time, going back to 1994, the incident of people who feel a strong sense of belonging to, and I draw your attention largely to country and then ethnic group. You can see the country remains by far the salient source of identity in Canada, which is interesting because the numbers in Quebec are very low and we still, on world values, would probably rank very close to the top of the list. The numbers, though, who affiliated themselves with the ethnic group, which was at 55% in 1994, has actually dropped down to almost insignificant levels. So it wasn't that it didn't happen, it was actually the other way around. And this is true, uh, and as first generation Canadians become second generations, their attachment to Canada rises even more, and their attachment to their ethnic group declines even further. I think this is an important antidote to these discussions because they are such a critical part of the current debate. And on that same topic, I'd like to look at the issue of immigration. And Canada has been very blessed to be one of the few countries that solved the postmodern riddle of immigration, which has plagued Europe and America, where it tears those societies apart. There's a variety of reasons that's happened. But we have seen, and I have found that in my measures of where people are moving in the political spectrum and vote intention, that it is now Attitudes to immigration, which is the most important predictor of whether you're how you're going to change your views. It's never been a ballot booth issue in Canada, and now it's the primary engine dividing Canadians into various groups, and this open-ordered one is at the forefront. I also thought it's important to recognize that when we look at this through time, and there's something wrong with my diagram, but the, uh, the overall patterns are pretty clear. Opposition to immigration, and in fact opposition to visible minority immigration, was much higher in the mid-90s than it is today. So I think just as we see the important lessons that ethnic identities have actually relaxed and national attachments remain pretty high, the idea that, um, that opposition to immigration has inflamed 
I think it's inflamed in certain groups, and I'll show you that in a moment, but overall the pattern is one that shows a, a very clear decline to a more welcoming kind of, uh, society. Just to show you where some of the fault lines are, what's different in this picture? This question says, forgetting about the overall number of immigrants coming to the country, of those who are coming, do you think too few or too many are members of visible minorities? which when I re randomly rotate an experiment with, uh, with not white, I get exactly the same results. So, you know, it, it's, it may be a benign expression, but it is racial intolerance. And, you know, it's, it's not great to see the numbers that uh, subscribe to that, but you can see just how vividly those are divided along uh, uh, party constituencies. And those divisions are much larger in the past, and that is linked to this immigration and refugee asylum, and, uh, asylum seekers and so forth. Is, are now such potent issues, uh, it, it, but they are very much the paradox of how can the opposition be declining and they're becoming more important in the political landscape, it's because of the concentration and the emotional, emotional attachment within those groups. And by the way, one of the half, there's experimental research in the states that showed that in areas which experienced dislocation due to trade or robotization, it produced increased hostility to outgroups. So just so we can make this clear, people didn't become more economically insecure because they became more racially intolerant. If we're getting the causal sequencing right, I like to have my causes prece preceding my events, my effects, call me old fashioned. But, but I think that's important because the point is that a moral lecture on how this is repugnant and deplorable and all that avoids understanding the true engine which produced this in the first place and actually isn't going to, uh, it's dealing with the aggravated symptoms rather than the fundamental causes. Trade, I just throw in an issue of trade because it's interesting that if opposition to immigration is dropping, opposite support for trade is rising, particularly trilateral free trade. Well, you know, if we throw in foreign direct investment, those are the three stools of uh, the three legged, three legs of the three legged stool of globalization. And they're going up, not down. That's the highest support we've ever seen registered for NAFTA or whatever, USMAC or whatever it's called. The, uh, by the way, bilateral trade support's a little lower, still strong. Um, so whether it's related to that earlier slide showing the rise in economic, the sense that the future might be, a better future might be possible again, or maybe I'm back in the middle class, I think we need to look at that a little closer. But I remain uh, fixed on the idea that the solution to this is to restoring that kind of sense of middle class progress and shared prosperity, and that these aggravation, aggravated problems will probably diminish if that problem's dealt with. Um, I do want to talk, you saw in the, the, the fault lines on immigration, how dramatic those are. We haven't seen those in the past. We have got kind of two Canadas now, and they're largely incommensurable, just as there's two Americas. And that's obviously problematic, but, and we have to find ways of transcending that. But here's another one, which I thought would be of interest to those in the room. Uh, the question here was one that said, what do you think should be the most important issue for the next federal e election? And we have a number of these, and this isn't the one that exhausted. But it is interesting to look at the relative location of climate change across different constituencies. So for liberals, NDP, Green Party supporters, bloc supporters, it's the most important issue. For conservatives, drill, baby, drill. <laughs> So that's a pretty, a pretty dramatic difference. By the way, Alberta's about 13 points on this one. So <laughs> I thought I'd show one final slide. I think this is my final slide. Uh, and I want to talk about what's going on with male millennials versus female millennials. Usually the uh, generational cohorts, there are the young cohorts, look pretty much the same. That's breaking down. And think about the Milo, uh, Jordan Peterson world. But this is chart here shows the incidence of young males who voted for uh, Rob Ford in Ontario versus young females. For young females, it was a 25 point advantage to the NDP. It was tied. And that thing spills over into, uh, by the way, higher levels of intensity in terms of emotional attachment. Turnout rates were 10 points higher amongst young males. I've seen evidence in states that they're gonna turn out more for the midterms as well. Probably the same ones that are upset. We can't get into all the reasons now. Uh, male vote, how well do you think all that kind of uh, uh, strategy is working? The, the Liberals have gone from having a four-point advantage to a 17-point disadvantage with women, a 22-point shift on the women's vote. On the university versus non-university educated, pretty tabletop flat in the last election, similar about a 20-odd point erosion of the non-university 
vote who are now very angry at the university uh, professional crowd, the latte sipping elites who they see having authored their misfortune while they've been in trouble. Okay, I've got two, 20 seconds to finish the conclusion, which I think have all been self-evident so we can just go through this. This new or ordered op uh, populism is the new engine driving the uh, political landscape. We have to understand its true roots. It was initiated by the end of progress, fears of a more dangerous world. It's mutated into these cultural factors. We need to understand that these have produced fundamental new shifts and thought lines which are disturbing. The old oscillations which have been promiscuous progressives looking around for an answer have been transformed into a defection of ordered pop into the ordered populist camp which is largely focused in younger voters, uh, uh, social, uh, uh, social class education and gender. And I, I think I'm out of time or I'm, I've had They've added, I've added like it's like a soccer game. You get an extra. <laughs> no, I, I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs>